All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, this webinar, um, AI and the Adirondacks. Um, it's a two-part webinar series on how to create um, text and images. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to get started today uh, with Dr. Katie Gary. Jero, Jero. <laughs> I, uh, okay. Ooh. All right. So, hey, all y'all, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Um, this webinar is presented by Northern New York Library Network as part of our continuing education program. Um, I'm Lydia Willoughby. I'm the regional services librarian here. Um, I use all pronouns, um, so please mix them up. Um, I'm joined actually by just Katie today. Um, we have re real-time transcription running during this webinar. You can activate closed captioning by clicking on the show captions button. Um, I'm in many more people. So yeah, uh, you can activate closed captioning. Welcome if you're just coming in. Um, uh, you can toggle those settings on and off at any time during the webinar for closed captioning. Um, and in order to actively participate, you can use the chat feature as well as the Q&A. And if you have a question, we'll get to it at the end. Um, I highly recommend you dropping something in the chat or the Q&A as you have the idea so that we can be sure um, to answer your questions at the end. Um, and then I also just would like to let everybody know, um, I'm putting it in the chat now, um, we have collaboration guidelines um, for our um, all participants, um, and uh, yeah, it's really just about making sure um, to foster a culture of openness, active listening, uh, mutual learning and collaboration. So I'm just going to drop a link directly to our collaboration guidelines in here so you can take a look. Um, okay, moving on, next one. Um, yeah, so please take a moment now to, um, to introduce yourself on the chat if you'd like. Um, say where you're from or where you're working. Um, and make sure to note whether you're replying to only hosts or to all participants. Um, and yeah, like I said, please save questions for the Q&A and use that option to make sure you get your answers, quest your questions answered. Um, I want to pause now to acknowledge that we owe an unpayable debt. Oh, there we go. Make sure you can see that. Um, I'd like to pause now to acknowledge that we owe an unpayable debt to generations past of our land and lineage. Our seven county region in Northern New York is the homeland of the Mohawk, Onondaga, Oneida of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and include Oneida ter territory in Green Bay, Wisconsin, as well as lands in Quebec and Ontario. We advocate for the autonomy of this, the First Nation today and support sovereignty in their homelands. Um, we also owe an unpayable debt of reparations to the generations past of their labor and lineage. This land's cultural heritage also intersects with the forced labor of Africans and resistance to enslavement in New York State until the late 1820s. It's this intersection of settler colonialism and heritage of racial, racial caste, forced labor camps, and policing that have contributed to the wealth and resources of our past, present, and future economies in Northern New York. Let our work today be toward healing, um, together for the future and the present. Okay, so without further ado, okay, together, <laughs> dearly beloved, we're gathered here today to celebrate Dr. Katie Jarrow, who is a poet, essayist, and human AI interaction researcher with a focus on technology for impactful writing and understanding the limits and capabilities. Um, just admitting another person. Um, limits and capabilities um, of large language models. Currently a postdoctoral fellow in computer science with uh, Elena Glassman at Harvard University. Um, and uh, Katie recently completed a PhD at Columbia with Lydia Chilton um, and has um, been supported by an NSF graduate research fellowship from the Brown Institute for Media Innovation. So take it away, Dr. Gerald. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, all right, let me share my slides. Okay, hopefully that looks good. And yeah, I'm really excited to kind of see everyone's questions or comments or kind of responses. So um, 
feel free to put things in the chat or the, the Q&A and kind of at some break points in the talk. Um, we can try to get to those. Uh, and hopefully, I, I, my plan is like not to talk for a whole hour. <laughs> so hopefully there's a lot of time to kind of uh, talk with you guys about um, your thoughts and, and kind of what's going on in your world. Because I feel like I live in a very different world, which is the land of computer science most of the time, which can be a funny world to live in. So I want to today talk about my research, which I always kind of loosely group around this theme of AI and the writer. Um, and in particular, like um, I think about how we can use language models to support creative writing. And so like today, language models are very large. So we have a call them large language models or LLMs, uh, but I actually started this work back in 2017. The language models were much smaller um, and they behaved a little bit differently. And the whole kind of world of text generation um, was really different than it was today. So I, you know, just to bring like a little bit of context um, about how my work has changed over the past several years. I tend to like to talk, start my talks, though, as like a group of librarians, you probably don't need this spiel as much as other groups that I talk to need it. Um, but I like to talk about writing as this keystone of human cultural activity. So you could be interested in poetry or political commentary. Either way, um, words are one of the primary ways that we communicate complex ideas with each other. And so most of us would like to be better writers, partially because writing is one of these really great ways to impact the world around us, right? So you sit down by yourself or with a small group of people and you write something that can be read by hundreds or thousands or millions of people around the world. So it's a really impactful way to get your ideas out there. And that's one reason a lot of people would like to be better writers. Um, but writing is also this fundamental human communicative act, right? It's one of the few ways we communicate with each other. And so it's also a way that we that allows us to be seen and heard and understood. So in addition to people wanting to be better writers so that their ideas can kind of spread around the world, uh, we also want to be better writers just so that we have this feeling of being like properly understood by others. And so at a very, very high level, what I'm interested in as an academic researcher is how will AI change writing? And if we think writing is really important, then I think this question becomes equally important for us to consider. And it's become very clear over the past few years that AI will and in fact has already changed writing. But I think as technologists, computer scientists, researchers, librarians, anyone kind of interacting with this world of writing, I think the how part of this question is still really big. So there's a lot of questions about like how is AI changing writing right now, but also about how would we like it to change writing in the future and what can we do to actually like create a future where AI is changing writing in a way that we feel good about. Um, and I think as we've started to see the technology get a lot better, um, not everyone has been happy with how it's been changing writing. And so I think this question becomes important, not just because writing is important, but because we want to make sure that we're moving in a direction that we all feel pretty good about. Um, to be really specific, as an academic researcher, I have research questions that I'm interested in. And there's two kinds of questions that I tend to work on. The first are technical questions. So these are questions about how language model works um, or how we can do better text generation or how we, you know, do the kind of technical innovation that works on what will change writing. And in particular, the question that I've been interested in for the past five years or so is how do we design new text generation technologies that aid in communicative intent? And the reason I put this um, thing about communicative intent in here is because some researchers are interested in how AI can be like a better writer on its own. Um, I'm less interested in that question and more interested in the fact that a person might be interested in writing something that's going to be read by another person and we might have technological involvement in that process. Um, that's going to support them, right? So this is about communicative intent from a, from people to other people. And that's a slightly different goal than thinking about how we might think about like automatic text generation that has like a very minimal human involvement. But in addition to these technical questions, which can be kind of like computer science heavy, I'm also interested in the social questions that these technologies are proposing. So 
In particular, I've been interested in how we address issues of agency, authenticity, and responsibility in a broader social context as these new technical innovations get adopted. I'm not sure if you can hear my dog barking in the background, <laughs> but if you can, I apologize. I'm sure there's someone walking by the door. Um, so in addition to approaching these questions as um, a computer scientist and a technologist who's kind of really embedded in this world, I'm also approaching it as a writer in my own right. So my poems and essays have been published in places like Wired and Catapult. Um, I've done poetry residencies as well as fiction and essay writing residencies. Uh, I've read my poetry at a number of public poetry festivals. Um, and recently I've started being invited to different writing classes to speak about how AI is going to change creative writing. So this is both at the undergrad level as well as people getting an MFA, right? And these are people who are like super deeply embedded in their creative writing practice and they're trying to think about what's going on as the world of writing is changing a little bit right before our eyes. Um, and then finally, I hold some editorial positions as well, literary magazines. And so I come to this work, as I said, not just as an academic researcher, but someone who cares deeply about creative writing as um, this very human endeavor. So for both of these types of questions, the technical and the social, I've done a lot of different kinds of academic work. Um, I've done work on metaphor generation and how we can help people write more interesting metaphors. I've done some projects on generating new kinds of thesauruses that reflect certain um, artistic styles or certain writing styles. I'm also in work thinking about how we um, can change the way that we use language models to make them more creative, as well as work on how we can support science writing with language models, so communicating science to the general public. On the social side, um, I've done work on how people develop mental models of AI agents. So when you come to some kind of AI technology, like a large language model, you come up with some kind of understanding of how you think it works. And so I've done some work um, on trying to understand how people develop that understanding. Um, I also did some early work looking at how novelists were using language models as they started getting larger, hmm. um, as well as thinking about the social dynamics of what makes someone turn to a computer versus a person for help with their writing. And then more recently, I've gotten really interested in the ethical conundrum of the training data sets for these large language models. So I've done a bit of work on understanding why people aren't very interested in this, or like why it's not very incentivized in the academic community to study this. And I have an ongoing project looking at how we might do better data collection practices or data licensing practices in the future. Okay, so this is a lot of work. Um, obviously, I'm not gonna talk about all of it today, but if you're interested, in a particular piece, um, I'm happy to talk more uh, as we get through like discussion and such. Um, today, I'm going to talk about three pieces just to give you like a sense of the kind of work I do um, and how it might relate to the things that you guys are interested in. So I'll talk a bit about my science writing project, um, a bit about this idea of social dynamics. So why is someone turning to an AI in the first place? And then I want to spend some time actually in discussion with you guys about this work on what would better data collection for language models look like? So to get us started, um, I want to talk about science writing. And so I got interested in science writing kind of midway through my PhD because it's a really high impact domain. Lots of people would like to communicate their work better to the public. Um, but it also is a really like creative and interesting domain. So we got really interested in this form called tutorials, which were kind of getting really popular in like 2019. And a tutorial is basically a long Twitter thread where someone is explaining a technical concept. So this is a Twitter thread explaining this kind of in-depth research about how dung beetles navigate at night. Um, and what's great about these tutorials is they're both pretty technical. So you generally learn something kind of interesting and specific. But they're also really fun to read and because they're on Twitter, right? They're like tiffy and they're jokey and they have this great tone. And so tutorials were getting picked up um, in biology and computer science. The medical community actually has this huge tutorial community around like continuing education for doctors. And so we were really interested in this and it seemed like more people would write these, except for the fact that they're pretty hard to do well. 
Um, and it's this totally different format than most academics are used to writing in. So one thing we did is we just kind of studied this format on its own, kind of like as a social science project, looking at how science communication was changing as it moved online and into these new spheres. But what I want to talk about is kind of the work we did to actually like use AI technologies to see if we could help people write these better. And so around this time, language models were getting larger and we were starting to see that they were getting more, the text generation was getting more coherent. This was like on the cusp of GPT-3 coming out. So GPT-2 had come out, everyone was like, this is amazing. And GPT-3 was kind of in the works. So people were starting to see that these technologies had a lot of potential. And so we were interested in if we could use these models and like the predominant way that these models were used at the time was to like do sentence completion. Could we use these to actually help people write better tutorials? Now, the problem with using these technologies to write better tutorials um, is normally with these models, you have to give them a decent amount of text first in order for them to know how, like what they might suggest next. But tutorials are so short, there's like never really that much text. And when we were studying this um, with grad students, we found that people actually struggled most with how to start these because it's like the first tweet has to hook your audience. And so there wouldn't really be enough context to give the model for the model to know what it might generate that would be reasonable. So what we did is we developed these series of prompt templates. Um, this is kind of before, today we see prompting as like this huge field of like, how do you get ChatGPT to do what you want? This was a little bit before that, so people were still kind of figuring it out. And so we generated these prompt templates um, based on certain like expository and narrative theories that we hoped would get the language model to generate really good ideas about different technical topics. So our prompt templates would look something like this. It would be like whatever your topic was, so pseudo random number generators um, are used by. And then the idea is if you can get a computer to finish the sentence in a way that's interesting and relevant, it's gonna give a good idea to the writer about how they might wanna start their tutorial. Because the idea with starting the tutorial is it has to have something of interest to the average person. Um, and if you just say, I'm going to explain pseudo random number generators to you, that's actually not going to be that interesting for the average person reading your Twitter feed. So to give another example, and these templates are pretty simple, right? Um, one application of glacial retreat research in the real world is, and again, if you can come up with a good completion of this sentence, um, you're going to move towards an interesting idea for how to start. Um, start your tutorial. And you can see we were testing this with computer scientists, but also climate scientists um, who happen to just be like, as one might expect, very excited about communicating their work to the public. So there were two key insights to this project about getting language models to work for us. One is that these prompts are encoding something about, something we know about writing, right? They're encoding some kind of rhetorical structure. Um, so we were actually putting that in. The language model itself, right, doesn't necessarily know these things or know to access them at the right time. What we were trying to do is prime it to do certain rhetorical actions. But the second thing is we really needed the responses to these to be very specific. Um, and this was pretty hard to do back in the early, early 2020s. Um, and I'd argue even today, we're seeing some issues with the language models where they tend to be pretty vague or generic or just following like a typical form. And that's partially because of who they're designed by and who they're designed for. But in this case, we really needed the language model to be quite specific in order for it to be relevant. And that was something that was really hard to do. And so we actually developed a new algorithm for getting these language models to generate that would be more specific. Um, there's like some technical details here that aren't super important, but I want to share them just to suggest that um, I think right now we tend to think of language models as something that are like given to us, right? You like access them through some corporation and that corporation has a huge amount of control over what the language model is doing. And so the reason I'm gonna briefly go over this kind of technical algorithm for sentence completion is just to say that actually there's a lot of knobs behind the scenes that you can turn to change the way that these things work. And that was a lot more obvious five years ago when these were like little research instruments um, before they had become these like big corporate entities. And so I like to remind us that even though it feels right now like we don't have a lot of control over these things, 
there is actually a lot of things that can be done and we could imagine a different world where these models are developed by different groups of people or different organizations and we do have more control over how they work. So the problem we had in this study was that the way that they would generate text when you just like use them off the shelf was very vague and repetitive. There are a couple of techniques that you would normally use to fix this, but it wouldn't work in our context because we also wanted the text to be pretty like true um, in the sense of we wanted it to be accurate to be about the topic. So the first thing we did is we wanted to find a way to make more specific words more likely to be generated. Um, and we actually did this by going in and modifying what's called the probability distribution that's coming out of the model. And again, I'm saying this just to say like, these models, there's a lot of different ways to make them work. And we were actually able to go in and fuss with it to really change the way it was generating text. Then we wanted to increase the diversity of the kinds of things it would generate. So that if you generated from the same prompt multiple times, this is like hitting the regenerate button in ChatGPT, you would get something significantly different every time because we wanted it to be able to provide ideas to the writer. And then we had this technique to try to preserve the accuracy. So again, this has to do with how we're selecting the words that come next out of the language model. And we used a particular algorithm that's meant to help preserve um, the accuracy of what's coming out of them. So we took this new algorithm, right, that we developed custom, and we embedded this whole thing into a web app so that people could use it. The writer picks from a series of different templated prompts. These were like the prompts that are meant to encode the rhetorical knowledge. They can also add their own prompt if they want to try something else. And then they hit the generate button and they can generate a series of ideas about their topic. Uh, one thing to note that we did kind of on purpose when we built this little web app is the place where the ideas are, are in this pink box. And then the writing is in the white box below. And so the idea was this wasn't meant to be writing for you, but kind of providing you with ways that you might start your tutorial. Um, and I think this was at the time didn't seem like the craziest decision, but I, I think it is interesting to think about how the interfaces of these technologies really change the way that people interact with them and can suggest different ways of interacting. So this wasn't something where as you're typing, it would suggest the end of your sentence, right? Because the idea wasn't to suggest that it was doing any writing for you, but rather just giving you some ideas. So there's typically two ways that I evaluate things like this. One is I look at the quality of the text generation system on its own. So we called what the um, computer generated sparks because they're meant to spark ideas. And we wanted to look at how well it was doing across a lot of different scientific topics. But then we also wanted to see how these things are used in a real life writing context. So we recruited a bunch of STEM graduate students to write tutorials on their own research, making use of this system to see how it was working for them. So the first thing we looked at is um, how coherent or accurate were the things we generated as well as how diverse were they. And we had three different conditions that we were looking at. The first, we actually had people, like we hired um, graduate students or early career researchers to come in and complete these prompts on their own. So we had what we called a human written gold standard. This is like as good as a human could do on this task. Then we had a baseline decoding method. So this was what you would get if you just took a model off the shelf. And then we compared this to our custom algorithm, which we were doing to try to improve what you would get off the shelf. So we're measuring coherence, which is kind of approximately like how true is this statement, um, as well as how diverse the things coming out of this model are. And so what we see first with coherence is that you know, all the way on the left is the baseline decoding. In the middle, we have our custom condition. So we're doing actually a pretty big improvement over what would happen if you just took something off the shelf. Um, and then on the far right, in the lightest color, we have what a human can do. So we're not doing as well as what a person could do, um, which is maybe very obvious. Um, and this is true also when we look at diversity. So we're a big improvement of diversity over the baseline, like what you would get off the shelf. Um, but as expected, people are able to be pretty diverse when you tell them to, um, and these models kind of struggle to be as diverse. So next we wanted to look at how writers would actually make use of this system in a real world writing task. So we recruited 13 graduate students across a number of different disciplines. We actually had them pick their own topics that they were gonna write about. 
this is to really kind of stress test the system and topics that we might not have thought to test. And so the first thing that I always look at in studies like this is how many people actually thought this system was useful. Um, we found that of our 13 participants, nine said it was great, they loved it, really helped them with the task. Four said it wasn't useful. And the reason these people said it wasn't useful was either because they thought the suggestions didn't make any sense, like they weren't true or they were irrelevant, or they said the suggestions were fine, but they felt like they already knew everything that was being suggested. So it wasn't giving them anything new. But I think what's really interesting is if you go into the people who actually found the system useful, they often used it in really different ways. So we had three main use cases that we saw come up in this study. The first was inspiration. Um, this is kind of what we intended. The idea was it was meant to give ideas to the writer. And so this is one participant in our study talking about how their specialty, very specific and technical, and she can struggle to figure out how to make it relevant to people who don't study this or are kind of in her world. Um, the things that the system suggested kind of helped to remind her how to connect her research to the average person. But some people used it for what we call translation, um, which is basically just kind of like writing a sentence that they wanted to write anyway, but it would write it really fast and very concisely. So another participant described this as um, it was articulating ideas that were already in their head, but it was doing it in a way that was short and concise. Another participant talked about how like to write that kind of sentence, they would probably sit down, write like three sentences and then have to collapse it into one short sentence because they knew it was too verbose, where the system helped them just kind of work through those sentences really quickly. Now, the third use case we saw was really interesting and pretty unexpected. We call it the perspective use case. And one participant described this um, in a particular way where she's saying the research that I do around sexism is not concerned with people's attitudes, but instead concerned with more measurable things like income levels, legal rights, this kind of stuff. But the system kept suggesting to her these ideas about sexism as an attitude that people have. She was like, oh, I wouldn't have even thought about that because she's so in her research, she thinks about it as these measurable things. But it is true that when you talk, tell the average person that you study public health outcomes as they relate to sexism, people are going to think of oh, sexist attitudes. And so what I think is really interesting about this is this was actually a case where the language model was getting it wrong. It was like misinterpreting this woman's topic. However, it was misinterpreting it in a way that the average person might also misinterpret her topic. And so the fact that it got her topic somewhat wrong actually helped remind her that people coming to her topic and reading about it might also have some misconceptions that she's going to have to have to pick. And the reason I find this use case particularly interesting is because it's like a twist on um, the language model of getting something wrong. We tend to think that's bad, uh, but I think it's interesting to think about the language model as instead providing this kind of generic perspective that you can then use and think and reason about as a person, like, is this the perspective that I'm trying to get to, um, uh, like, tackle in my work? So one thing that I've been really interested in in a lot of my work, and I was interested in it here too, is what predicts usage and satisfaction of these kinds of models. So if you recall, there was like nine participants who really liked this system and four who said it wasn't very useful. And so one question is like, what's the difference between these two groups of people? Why do some people really not like it and others really like it? And I think we can even kind of think about this now with things like ChatGPT, where some people really enjoy using these things um, in different parts of their life and for different writing tasks. And some people like really, really don't like it. And actually some people think it's like very bad at writing. And yet other people are using it all the time and say, oh, this is so helpful. And so. I've always had this question of like, what's the difference between these people? Because it seems like they're using the same thing. And so this study, uh, let me ask this pretty clearly, because we could actually measure how good we thought the model was generating text for different people. And then we could compare that to how much the person liked it. So on the x-axis here, we're going to plot the average coherence or like accuracy of what was suggested to the person. Um, this is loosely a model of how well we think the model is performing. And then on the y-axis, I put um, the results of something called the Creativity Support Index, which is basically a survey that you give to participants 
and it measures approximately how useful it was for them to do a creative task. And what we would like to see here, maybe we would expect to see is as the system gets better, um, right, so as the coherence improves, we should expect to see that people like the system more. So there should be some kind of nice positive correlation, but approximate straight line from the bottom left to the top right, showing that as these systems get better, people tend to like them more. But as you might expect, um, we saw no correlation here, and I think this is repeated in a lot of other studies with language models, um, which is some people saw suggestions that we thought were actually pretty good, and they really don't like the system. And other people saw suggestions that we actually thought were pretty bad, and some of those people really liked the system. And so this was really <laughs> nagging at me, so I was like, okay, this suggests that we really have no idea what's going on here. Like, why do some people really like this and others don't? When it's not clearly, at least solely, related to how good these systems are. And this is what brings me um, to the second study I want to talk about, which is like, why would someone ask for help from a computer in the first place? Um, I'm just checking on time. Uh, and in the chat. Yeah. Okay, so I found interested in this question of why would someone go to a computer versus a person for support? And to do this, I did a big interview study with 20 creative writers, including some writers who are currently using an AI support tool as part of their practice. So they interviewed poets and novelists, as well as science journalists, TV writers, um, pulp fiction writers, people who are earning their living writing books. So they did a formal analysis of these transcripts, which resulted in this two level taxonomy of the things that kind of came up in all of these interviews. So there were three main pillars of things that came up in these interviews. The first was people's desires for the artifact or whatever they're writing. Um, this is basically like things that they are trying to achieve in their writing that they might want help with. The second is what we call perception of the support actor, where the support actor could be a person or a computer or anything that might give them help. And so the perception is people's like understanding of what kind of help that they could ask for. And then finally, writers have these values about the kinds of support interactions they're interested in having, right? So there's certain kinds of help that people are just, some people are just fundamentally against, no matter how good that help is, for instance. Now, I think it's useful to think about these not just as um, like three themes that came up in an interview, but how they relate to each other. And I like to describe this as the external versus internal dynamic of support. So if you were to sit down and ask a writer to, or like watch a writer ask for help, you might see something like this. The writer is sitting there creating their artifact, whatever writing project they're working on. At some point, they go and request help from someone or something. And then that support actor, which could be a computer or a person, comes back and supports them in the creative process. And what I've highlighted here in red is what we might call, call the support interaction, right? This is the writer interacting with whatever supporting them. But when you sit down and you talk to writers about what's actually going on when they ask for help, no one's really talking about this stuff. This is like the very practical, mechanical part of asking for help. Instead, people talk about what I call the internal dynamics of support. So a writer isn't just sitting there writing. They have desires what they're trying to achieve, and they know that some of the things they're trying to achieve, they're going to struggle to achieve on their own. And then they don't just go out and ask for help from someone, right? You have this sense of the kinds of help you could ask for and what's going to be most helpful for this particular thing, right? So there's this whole um, step prior to asking for help where you have to perceive what's available and kind of pick from your options. And then finally, we all have these values that dictate what do we think is like a reasonable kind of help to ask for, right? You might think certain kinds of help are totally cool and other kinds of help maybe are like cheating or not the kinds of help you're interested in having given like your personal writing practice. So this is to kind of help um, identify like how these things relate to each other. And so for each of these, um, if you were to like go read this paper, each of the like boxes here are kind of its own little result about what's going on here when people are asking for support. I'm gonna try to very briefly go over just two of them, um, even though they're all really interesting. So the first one, which I'm gonna go over kind of quickly because I wanna make sure we have a lot of time to talk at the end, um, is this idea of individuality. 
So when people ask for help, they have a sense of the individual characteristics of the people or things that they can ask for help from. So one is levels and kinds of expertise. So how good are you at writing? What's your education level? Um, how much experience do you have with the thing that we're writing about? But people also talk about personal experience. So what kind of personal perspective is someone gonna to bring to this work? And is that the perspective that you're looking for when you're looking for help? And this all kind of ties into this larger idea that all the writers I talked to understood that there's no universal reader, right? There's no perfect objective perspective on your work who can give you like the one true piece of feedback. Um, instead, everyone is bringing some kind of perspective. And I think most of the writers I talked to kind of intuitively understood that this was true with computers also. Right, so computers are not providing some kind of objective or neutral perspective on your work. They would need to understand what kind of perspective the computer is bringing to their work. And that's going to modulate if they would turn to that particular program or commercial product or whatever for help. Which is not to say that writers are developing this pretty sophisticated mental model of support actors' individual characteristics. And this is going to modulate who or what they turn to for support in different cases of writing or different things that they're trying to do. Now, I want to touch briefly on this idea of authenticity because A, it comes up all the time when you do like computer supported creative work. Um, and I think with large language models and also AI images and this kind of stuff, authenticity is becoming this bigger question. And so in our study, we saw a lot of different um, ways to kind of tackle this question of authenticity. The first is that writers don't just think about their own personal sense of authenticity, but the reader's sense of their authenticity, right? What are you projecting to your audience? Writers are also thinking about the impact of simply viewing suggestions. So just because you decide not to take something from an AI that has been suggested to you doesn't mean that seeing it hasn't changed what you're going to do. Um, this has actually been borne out in work that came after this where people showed that if you're showing people suggestions when they're writing, even if people say, oh, I didn't take any of those suggestions, or I didn't even look at the suggestions, um, we can actually measurably see that people's writing changes just from having the suggestions on the screen. And this is something that writers are sensitive to. Sometimes you don't want any kind of help or any kind of feedback, um, even if you don't think you're going to take it, because just seeing it can change the way you think about something. Writers also had really differing opinions on where in the writing process authenticity lies. So some people thought crafting the ending is like really key for them to do on their own, whereas others think, you know, the storyline at a high level is what they're contributing. Um, not everyone agrees like, oh, if you let a computer do X, you lose your authenticity, right? There's all of these different points in the writing process where a computer could get involved. And no one really agrees that there's like a specific point that's like totally off limits. It really depends on your own personal perspective of what you're contributing to the writing process. Finally, something that was pretty interesting is that because our relationship to people is very personal and has the potential to have like long term uh, aspects to it, people tend to think that when someone they're very close to gives them help, that's less of a threat to their authenticity because you have this kind of personal relationship where that person feels kind of closer to your sense of self. Whereas if a stranger gives you help, that's more of a threat to authenticity because you don't have a stronger relationship. They're more kind of outside of yourself. Um, but with computers, people tend to not have long-term relationships with them. At least the average person using a computer for writing doesn't. And so people don't have a lot of the fears that they have about showing computers their work that you might have with a person. Computers are quite private and don't really tend to expose people to the kind of vulnerabilities that you feel exposed to when you share your writing with another person. So overall, writers' comfort with different kinds of influence is motivated by where their sense of authenticity lies, and there's no kind of one place, right? There's a lot of different opinions on this. So to quickly go back to this idea of what makes some participants find a system useful and others not, I think these internal dynamics of support can really help us understand um, why people react in really different ways to the exact same system. So to give a very simple example, we can ask for any given support system, what values does this system support or negate? So some writers really value independence for idea generation. So if you see some kind of AI writing system as helping you with idea generation, 
the writers who really value idea generation probably aren't going to like your system no matter how good it is right and they might even have a bunch of problems with it to demonstrate that the ideas are not very good but some writers think the execution of an idea is way more important than coming up with the idea themselves and these people are likely to find um systems that give ideas to them like really useful right because they don't have this sense that they need to do the idea thing themselves and they might even find ways to use a system that's pretty bad right but they'll find some way to make it useful so i think this um this like model of thinking about what's going on when people ask for help can even today with like people incorporating large language models help us think through why some people like this in certain situations and some people really don't now what i want to end with and hopefully this will be quick and we can actually spend some time talking with each other is as large language models have gotten very popular and very large um there's been a huge amount of backlash from the writers whose writing was used to train these models so you may have been following this stuff in the news but a number of writers have been suing OpenAI and other corporations over the use of their writing. Um, this has also been happening in like the visual arts, right? So we're seeing this happening with visual artists suing different corporations. Um, I'm going to focus like specifically on the writing aspect, even though I think there's a lot of parallels here. And so one of my questions is, okay, I think if you're a writer whose work was taken to train one of these models, you have very, very legitimate reasons to be upset. Um, and I think the class action lawsuits are great. But I also think we need to think about how we might move forward in this situation. Um, and so what are writers actually really upset about? Because I think there's a lot of different things we could be upset about in this situation. And how might we envision a world where we could create a language model where writers would be happy to use them, right? And so what I've started doing is a big interview study asking under what circumstances, if any, would literary writers want their own writing included as training data for a model? And I think there's a number of like really interesting and important questions to ask here. Like, how do people want to be credited or compensated? What would a writer get out of their data being used responsibly? Like, you're not gonna, even if everything is kind of set up properly consensually, um, if you don't think there's any value to these models, you're never gonna want to contribute to them. So there's a question of what does the average writer even get out of large language models existing in the world? Do writers have certain restrictions on how they want these models to be used, right? This is kind of a classic case of maybe you're okay with research applications, but you're not okay with commercial applications. Maybe you're okay with educational applications, but you're not okay with um, applications that compete for your job, for instance. And then there's always a question of are these restrictions like technically or legally feasible and all these things are kind of playing out before our eyes right now and so what i'm hoping to get out of this work and to get out of these interviews with the writers is a way to imagine something like a new kind of licensing agreement and it might not be a licensing agreement it might be something else um, there's a couple of models trying to do like trust agreements where data is kind of put into a kind of trust um and so the question is like what would this kind of agreement contain right like well, how can we imagine if we were to collect a data set or have a data set you know from a library and we were interested in letting it be used to train a language model what kind of um restrictions or safeguards would we put around it and i think this is a totally open question like i really don't think anyone knows um the answer to this question yet and i think a lot of people are trying to figure out what is the answer to this question and so this is a question I'm actually like super curious to hear what you all think if you have opinions on this, which is, you know, as people who are in charge of different collections, like if you were going to let someone use this collection for a particular application, how do you think about what the restrictions are? Or how do you safeguard what you see as like the rights and protections of the people who originally created this data? I'm also happy to take other questions, um, but if anyone has thoughts on this or wants to talk about this, uh, we have about 15 minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Um, 
I I have a question I just wanted to start with because I, I took a note earlier and I um I guess I was just it's more I guess it's about the taxonomy of and the dynamics of support. Um I mm -hmm. found this so interesting as like a former instruction coordinator, <laughs> maybe current. Um, but just thinking about those as um also so many of the kinds of decisions like I've seen um academic research support services kind of have to envision. So I found that super interesting just about the um the sense of like whether or not, you know, like your personal values and your authenticity and things like that, like um, or your perception of others' authenticity impacting like how you would access research services. <laughs> and I guess that makes a lot of sense, but it's really nice to see that, you know, articulated with data, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't done this work. I mean, right when I did it, I was people talked a lot about asking for help from like other people or right other kinds of resources that are run by people. Um, and yeah, even though it's kind of pointless to understand, well, why? What's up with computers? Um, I do think it speaks a lot just to how people want help <laughs> generally um, and what kind of resources are like okay or not okay with accessing. Hmm. Have you, um, I'm just looking at the, um, the folks that are here today. Thank you so much for being here. There's like a, a mix of people from school systems and public libraries and um, academic institutions. And um, I'm, I guess I'm sort of curious, like um, what, um, what your perception is of, um, I guess like off campus. <laughs> libraries or like have you um mm -hmm. participated much in um I don't know community <laughs> like large large language models in community yeah I mean so the project that I'm doing now um get back to this is uh partially based in this thing called the library innovation lab which is this weird little lab that's based in Harvard Law Library. So it's obviously not a community library, but um, they do a lot of the, the lab does a lot of work on like open sourcing different things so that things that are kind of traditionally only accessed in law schools hmm. can be accessed by anyone. Um, and I think one of the things from an AI perspective that I've been grappling with lately is like, you might have this attitude that, okay, we should make something freely available to everyone. And so this is sometimes called like open sourcing a model. So you might say, we're gonna, just to give the legal context, just cause that's kind of where I've been talking with a lot of people about this. Um, we're gonna train a model, like a language model that's trained on a bunch of legal documents. And we wanna then make this model available to anyone to use or to modify because we want it to be kind of open source and available for everyone. Um, one of the issues with that when it comes to AI is once you kind of make a model totally open source, it's very hard to put any restrictions on its usage. Mm -hmm. So you might say, I want to make this model, but I only want there to be non-commercial applications of it. If that's the case, you probably can't actually make it like totally 100% publicly available. Because then someone can go in and use it for a commercial application and you might never know. And so this is something I've been thinking a lot about in this case, which is how do you deal with this tension between me, you want to make things like available to communities, but you also want to make sure that you can protect the rights and interests of the people who created this thing. And how can you do both of those things at once? How can you make it like maximally available while mm. also protecting the rights and interests of mm. the people who created it? Hmm. I don't know. I'm really fascinated with the tutorial um, approach, though. I think that would be um, hmm, super interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, what what are some of the benefits of being 
I mean, being you <laughs> of your, of your <laughs> use, like I can't, it sounds to me like that old, you know, um, organizing thing where like, if you're, you know, you're doing an event or something and you offer an artist or a musician, like, oh, I can't pay you, but you get exposure. Um, right. yeah. <laughs> exploitive kind of thing. But yeah. This is like, so clearly it's like beyond exposure. It's, um, I think that there are, yeah, it's that tension, but maybe between like exposure and feeling like a little violated or like something's been taken from you. I don't know about feeling that, but I think that that is what leads people to the lawsuits. Um, yeah, I mean, in the interviews I've done so far with writers, there's definitely a strong sense of some kind of violation of her, right? Where you're like, I didn't give anyone permission to do this. And the only way someone could have done this is to like illegally download my work. And so there's like a number of points in the process where people rightfully, like they have been violated. Like it's not that they just feel violated, right? Like that is actually what happened. Mm -hmm. um, no one was asked for consent. And a lot of these works are not available online for free. Mm -hmm. So they must have been taken illegally somehow. Um, the question, for me is like, okay, well, let's say that we're gonna live in a world in the future where a violation isn't gonna happen, where someone will ask for your permission. And this is my sense from talking with people within the corporate tech world, which is they're not, I'm not, I don't like go on record for this. They're not gonna apologize for what they did in the past, but they'll probably try to do it differently in the future <laughs> is, um, is, is the sense of how I see it going. And so if there is going to be a consent process in the future, like you said, like, well, why would anyone consent to this? <laughs> like, why would anyone say yes? Um, now, a typical argument, right, your case of like, oh, can you come perform at my event? You'll get exposure. Well, the right way to do that, right, might to be say, can you come perform at my event? I will pay you. Mm -hmm. um, probably with these models, even if there's some kind of compensation stream, going to be pretty small because there's so many writers um, that would contribute and any one writer is contributing to something pretty small. So it's not clear to me that compensation is going to be enough of an argument um, hmm. because kind of like streaming your music on Spotify, like unless you're an extremely successful musician, you're not really making a ton of money. Even if you are an extremely successful musician, you might not be making a ton of money. So compensation probably isn't enough. Um, and this is something that I've been thinking deeply about, which is, well, is there any value to writers in like being part of this? And right now I see kind of three different potential ways a writer might see that this is valuable. Um, one is just like a pure research angle. So I think there is a lot of research to be done on these models as a kind of scientific progress thing. Like maybe we don't know right now the ways in which these models can be used for good, but it might be worth studying. And so people might be interested in contributing um, their work in the way that you might uh, do like a citizen science project or something where you're like, I just want to support these people who are studying this thing and I don't study this thing, but maybe I think it's good that other people study it. Um, the second thing is I think there are some kind of pro-social applications of these models that um, people are trying to develop in, for instance, education, um, in medical contexts, especially in like giving people access kind of around the world, giving people access to certain kinds of expertise mm -hmm. that maybe right now like are very hard to access if you live in Estonia. Or something like that and so people might see that there are some pro-social applications that they're interested in contributing to mm -hmm. um and then the final thing is just i think there are a lot of artists who are really interested in these models as like interesting artifacts for making art with or for interrogating right like what these models can and cannot do from an artistic perspective and so as a writer or as an artist, you might say, well, I'm not interested in making that kind of art myself. That's not what I do, but I think it's cool that other people do it. So maybe I want to contribute to letting other people do it in a way that's ethical and responsible. But I think it's a big, it's a big open question, which is 
if you wrote a novel or a nonfiction book, like why would you want your writing to be part of these moments? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I I could maybe see like somebody who wants to have a lot of different genres of writing or something. Mm -hmm. You know, like I write if I wanted to make our points north newsletter noir or <laughs> something like that, I guess I could um, run it, you know, I guess to change the, the style and maybe that would change like perspective um, or I found, yeah, I think that the perspective was like the most interesting thing, especially to get to your own sort of like blind spots. Like I think that, um, I'm going to call it the feminist blind spot that happened earlier that you spoke about where someone was like, oh, I didn't think about like, I research like sexism and I look at, you know, the economic like statistical impact of it or something. And then, you know, I guess realizing when you talk to a larger community, you know, it's a different perception. Um, so I don't know. I thought that was um, very interesting. Um, yeah. Does anyone um, have any like uh, questions, comments, any final thoughts in the in the chat or Q and A? <clears throat> and if that is where we're at, then I I have just like one more um, closing announcement. Or Katie, do you have any last last takeaways? Um, no, just if uh, if you're, um, I guess I don't have. I'll go back to my first slide. But um, yeah, if you have any questions about this work or you want to talk to me about it later, um, feel free to contact me. Mm. Wow, thank you so much. This was like so dense and wonderful. And I know that you shared the slides with me and I'm going to share them um, with the uh, uh, people who have registered for this. So you can see it later. Um, I'm going to drop the, um, the, the last <laughs> form I put in the chat is an evaluation form if you have a moment. Um, to just give us a little feedback. And then I am just going to uh, share my screen one last time. And um, again, I guess, thanks folks for being here and just let you know that next um, month. Um, so yeah, so we've got another one of these sessions. The next one is going to be February 20th um, on, um, on text, I'm sorry, on images, on images and AI. Um, so we're going to be looking um, at the creator, Doug Smith, and his Instagram account um, at a ADK Legends, um, and we'll be looking at that. And then in March, I'm really excited to announce that Lloyda garcia Fabo is going to be speaking um, with us for an international perspective on book banning um, and just the freedom to read. Um, so thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, please, you know, be in touch with me if you have further questions or comments. Have a great day. Thank you.